Hello and welcome to our video summary of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Now, I made this video for two reasons. The first reason being, if you have been following this course in detail and you have gone through both the introduction to the novella as well as all the different chapters that I've read through, then this will be a really, really nice video that summarises everything in a nutshell, including the plot, all the key characters, the quotations that you need to remember in advance of the exams, and this is especially useful before we dive into the exam question practice. However, the second reason why I've created this video is for some of our students who may not have that much time. So maybe you have downloaded this course with the pressure of time and you don't necessarily have that much time before your exams or your final assessments and you need something that kind of goes straight to the point in terms of just summarizing everything really quickly because you don't necessarily have the luxury of time. So you've come to the right video for both and I hope you're going to find this really useful. So as you can see behind me here, I've created essentially a Jekyll and Hyde mind map. Now don't worry, I do have a digital copy of this exact mind map that you can download as part of the resources. However, I think it would be really useful to just essentially go through in a nutshell exactly what the plot entails what kind of genre this book belongs to but also other key areas and also as you can see down here I've also noted down all the major quotations you can remember for all of the key characters and this will help you regardless of questions and as you will see from our exam practice questions you either will get a theme related question so a question related to a key theme or you will get a character related question now these quotations that I've selected here will be applicable to both so let's get started with essentially firstly summarizing the plot in a nutshell here so hopefully you can see it however just to clarify essentially the novella begins with Utterson and Enfield essentially taking a walk and Enfield essentially tells Utterson about this strange man Mr Hyde who he saw trampling a little girl very calmly and of course what this does is it already sets up Mr Hyde as somebody who's quite psychopathic really he's somebody who takes pleasure in other people's pain then the, as the story develops, essentially we find that Utterson goes and warns Dr. Jekyll, who we learn is a really respected scientist who lives in the very, very well-known and elite part of London. He warns him about Mr. Hyde because we learn that Dr. Jekyll has this strange relationship with Mr. Hyde. We don't know why. However, he's left his entire fortune in his will to Mr. Hyde. And Utterson essentially tells him, look, you need to be really careful about this association because I'm hearing really bad things about this man's reputation. Then as the novella develops, essentially we learn that Hyde, true to what Mr. Utterson has said, escalates his violent activity and he ultimately kills Sir Denvers Carew, who we learn is a well-known and respected politician and member of parliament and essentially he kills this older man and also the way he's described as killing this man is almost in a really animalistic way, he's a predator. He kills someone who's also weak and really cannot quite defend himself. Then essentially we then learn that Dr. Jekyll, who at first was a really sociable man, very outgoing, very pleasant and so on, he goes into hiding as well. And we don't know where Mr. Hyde is. However, Utterson obviously goes to Dr. Jekyll's house to essentially tell him, look at what happened. This is the man you're leaving all your money to. And he finds a much changed Dr. Jekyll. So Dr. Jekyll goes from being this very handsome looking man who is quite respectable in his 50s and he looks very, very withdrawn, very sick. However, Dr. Jekyll promises him that he will never see Mr. Hyde again and he even has a letter as evidence for Mr. Hyde that he's gone into hiding and the town will never see him again. And Mr. Utterson is actually really pleased and really relieved that Mr. Hyde is basically out of their lives. And he takes this letter back to his office, he gives it over to his clerk called Guest, but Guest does notice that the handwriting, which is a little bit weird, is actually quite similar to Dr. Jekyll's own handwriting. However, as the play develops, or rather as the novella develops, essentially we learn that Dr. Jekyll and Dr. Lanyon, who are two really good friends, and we know that this is a, tri a trio of friends, so we know that Utterson, Lanyon, and Dr. Jekyll are really close friends from quite young. However, they suddenly quite fall out and they stop talking to each other. And then the novella escalates and we find that Dr. Lanyon, not only does he fall out with Dr. Jekyll and he keeps it a secret, but when Mr. Utterson sees him, he's much, much sicker than he last saw him. So we first find in the beginning of the novella that Mr. Lanyon is really, really vivacious, 
very very sociable very positive and very healthy looking however by the time that Utterson sees Dr Lanyon he looks really sick and he says that he's going to die soon and he leaves another letter so this is the second letter and basically says that once he dies and if Dr Jekyll either disappears and or also dies Utterson can then read the letter so this adds to the mystery the mystery thickens and we don't quite know what the hell is going on then Lanyon does die then the novel starts to really speed up towards the end and effectively Mr Utterson and Enfield then see Dr Jekyll who also is now in seclusion he's been in seclusion for weeks and they walk past on the usual walks together and you should know that Utterson and Enfield their special relationship is because they are cousins they're relatives so they're walking and they see three windows outside Dr Jekyll's mansion and one of the windows which is halfway open Dr Jekyll is standing there and he looks really sad he looks like a prisoner Mr Utterson and Enfield ask him to come out for a walk with them maybe that's going to make him feel healthier however suddenly they see this look cross upon Dr Jekyll's face this look of abject terror and despair it's not described what it is but of course we later learn that this is Dr Jekyll essentially transforming into Mr Hyde however he shuts down the window and disappears and Utterson and Enfield don't really say a word they just walk and obviously start speaking afterwards and they say god forgive us once they reach a more crowded place so again there's still a lot of mystery then as the novel develops essentially dr jekyll ultimately completely disappears from society then paul one night approaches utterson's house essentially says that he thinks his master dr jekyll has died and somebody else is in his lab so essentially it's up to utterson and paul to break into the lab they break in they hear an animal scream and then they go and find the body of Dr Jekyll's clothes however the body belongs to Mr Hyde they then find a final letter and this is the letter from Dr Jekyll and essentially all three letters reveal that Dr Jekyll created a potion to make Mr Hyde in order to conceal himself from the public when he was doing really disreputable acts doing all of these horrendous deeds such as trampling the little girl and killing Sir Denver's Carew however he loses control of when he can transform into Mr Hyde so that's it for the plot now let's quickly talk about the genre and what genre this novella belongs to so do remember that this novella is gothic fiction and what does that mean gothic fiction became a really popular genre in the victorian era this is in the 1800s and essentially a typical characteristic of gothic fiction is it usually features the uncanny something that's really strange mysterious but also it features supernatural forces and of course in dr jekyll and mr hyde the supernatural element is the fact that dr jekyll is able to use science to transform into a completely different person or an alter ego also another aspect of the gothic fiction genre is the dark atmosphere that usually these categories of books show and of course we know that this dark atmosphere is created and it's created throughout so even from the start all the way to the end it's quite dark very uncanny very mysterious and a lot of pathetic fallacy is used and do remember that pathetic fallacy is when the weather is used to reflect the mood now this dark atmosphere creates within us as readers a really terrible sense of foreboding another aspect of gothic fiction is it usually features large castles large mansions and of course in the case of dr jekyll and mr hyde the large mansion belongs to dr jekyll on one end it's really beautiful it's on the more reputable and upper class side of london however the other end is in soho which is the disreputable side of london and this is where mr hyde sneaks in and he slinks in through the darkness there's no door there's no knocker however on the other side which is more reputable which is where dr jekyll enters and he invites all of these guests it's really beautiful and of course this can also represent the dual sides of the personality so now let's move on to context and of course it's really important to understand context when you are thinking about getting really really good marks and this is part of your AO4 in your exams you will be expected to write about contextual factors link either questions that you are going to answer to what was going on at the time of writing so in terms of context what you need to understand firstly is to do with religion but also this is tied to science and darwin and of course i'm referring to charles darwin now this was written in the victorian era victorian people were highly religious individuals and they believed in creationist views of how the world started in other words i'm referring to the book of genesis whereby god uh, is supposedly according to christian belief 
uh, he created the world in six days and then rested on the seventh day. This is in contrast to science and especially Charles Darwin who came up with the idea and the theory of evolution. So according to the Bible and according to the book of Genesis, God created man perfectly as he is and then he created animals as entirely separate beings so we as men have dominion over animals because we are different according to Christian theology however from a scientific perspective and especially this is what Charles Darwin came out with during the Victorian era and this upset a lot of religious people he actually said that man is not very different to animals actually we're an evolved form of an animal and we have an animalistic side inherent within us so this is something that conflicts with a lot of religious people at the time and of course this conflict is brought to bear in the novel so there's this huge conflict contextually speaking between religious beliefs and what science and darwinism had to say about evolution the other contextual factor to remember is to do with class and the victorian gentleman who is the victorian gentleman this means somebody who belongs to the upper class aristocracy and during the victorian time they were very distinctive even in how they dressed they would wear top hats they would wear long coats with tail uh, i suppose long tails <laughs> and um they usually happened to only frequent really really prestigious parts of london this is known as the west end this is areas such as Fitzrovia, um, Marleburn. However, Victorian gentlemen were also expected not to associate with people of a lower class. In other words, they were not to be expected to be, for instance, in the east end of London. This is the more working class district. It's also still known as a working class district today. However, it's become a bit more trendy. However, in the Victorian era, and of course this was during the Industrial Revolution, the East End of London and essentially all parts outside of West and Central London were where people of lower class frequented and Soho especially had a really negative reputation of being home to criminals, prostitutes and so it's obviously apt that Stevenson chooses for this to be where Hyde lives. So Victorian gentlemen were not expected to mix with people of a lower class otherwise that would affect their reputation and their social status. The other contextual factor and this is tied to the Victorian gentleman is to do with class and physiognomy. Now what does class mean? Class refers to the fact that in Victorian society, this society was highly divided according to the aristocracy, so these are the Victorian gentlemen and the people that were around their social circles versus the more working class people. And these divisions were really, really rigid. People could not risk their reputations, especially the aristocracy, by associating themselves with people who were from poorer classes because if you were from a poorer class, it was assumed, according to Victorians, that perhaps you also had very negative traits. This ties to physiognomy. This is the Victorian belief that you could understand and see somebody's soul based on their external appearance. Now Stevenson uses this when he's writing about Mr Hyde. He describes him as very ape-like in appearance, very short, quite dwarfish and this plays on the Victorian belief that if you were to see someone like Mr Hyde, he's short, quite dwarfish, very animal looking, then he must be quite evil and of course uh, Stevenson does imbue him with these evil traits. However, he goes against Victorian expectation of Mr Hyde being this evil person who belongs to this lower class of people by eventually showing that actually he's the same person as Dr Jekyll. So he's maybe also trying to show how misleading this trait is because actually what he's trying to show is that if Dr Jekyll, who's a very upper class man, is capable of creating Mr Hyde, then upper class people are just as capable of being evil as lower class people. And this concept of physiognomy, the idea that you can see somebody's soul externally is not necessarily valid. However, you do need to be aware of that in terms of contextual factors. Now, Let's move on to themes before we talk about quotes and key characters. Now the first theme, and this is obviously very directly related to the contextual factor of science and religion, is the theme of science and religion. So as I've mentioned before, there was a huge conflict between scientific ideas put forward by Darwin of the evolution of man, the idea that we are essentially uh, a, an evolved species of animals versus religious beliefs tied to the book of Genesis that we are a very superior form of man and actually there also is a god, right? So uh, there, there was a lot of also other scientific innovations at the time. 
also when you're thinking about science another school of science which is not necessarily very traditional however it really grew at that time with the school of psychology and there was a specific psychologist called Sigmund Freud who also added to this idea that we have an animalistic side he said in our minds and in our subconscious we had the visible side of our consciousness which is the super ego this is the socialized side this is the side that we show to society however the larger part of our subconscious which is called the id hid and suppressed our animalistic desires so again this is tied again to science this idea that we have this really evil side and this goes against religion whereby also in the bible it says that it's possible to be a very pure human being who lacks evil sides and an evil capacity and so there was a constant conflict and this conflict is shown through the novella we can see this constant friction between science and religion and that's why it's an important key theme to be aware of now the other theme to understand is that to do with reputation and of course this ties into the Victorian gentleman. Now Victorian gentlemen and people of the aristocracy, this is the upper class, this is the uppermost class, they were expected to guard their reputation viciously so they had to ensure that they only associated with other people who were of a similar social status otherwise they risked losing their reputation and if you lost your reputation you would be kicked out of these important social circles now Utterson is really preoccupied with Dr Jekyll's reputation he's so afraid that people are going to discover that Dr Jekyll who he believes is a separate person to Mr Hyde actually has this association with Mr Hyde he's constantly focused and preoccupied with protecting his reputation because rightly so society and especially upper class society would have outcasted Dr Jekyll so that's a really important thing to be aware of another thing to be aware of is that of secrecy and that ties into reputation so a lot of Victorian gentlemen because they were aware that they had to protect their reputation that led them to lead double lives and so they often had another side to them of course if you even think about chapter one when Enfield is heading home from a place at the end of the world to quote from the novel at three o'clock on a black winter morning we question where was he to even be in the same area as Mr Hyde and of course this shows that Enfield himself was living a secret double life right if he's awake at three o'clock in the morning we know that Mr Hyde lives in Soho so what's Enfield doing there he's probably engaging in the double life so secrecy was a big thing and also do remember when you're thinking about this theme Stevenson uses lots of symbols tied to secrecy the major symbol is to do with the letters so of course you know that there are three letters in the novella the first is the one that's supposedly from Mr Hyde promising that he'll never come back but of course we learn that that's Dr Jekyll the second letter is from Lanyon essentially revealing that Dr Jekyll has created a potion to turn into Mr Hyde and of course the third letter is Dr Jekyll basically confessing what he did however other symbols when, that refer to secrecy are firstly doors and also secondly windows. These refer to closing things behind doors, closing things behind windows and of course in the chapter whereby Enfield and Utterson see Dr Jekyll behind one of the three windows, this represents secrecy and especially when he starts transforming into Mr Hyde and he closes it, he hides that secret. Does that make sense? And so uh, secrecy is another key theme. And the final key theme to be aware of is the dual nature of man. And of course, that ties into the idea of Darwinian psychology and, uh, and also psychology. Uh, what dual nature of man means is that we it's impossible for any human being to have just one side. We are two dimensional creatures and we have two sides to us. We have our civilized side and of course this in from a psychological perspective means our super ego. This is the civilized side that we present to society. We have good behaviors that we present to society. However, the second side to man is the darker uncivilized side this is our animalistic side and from a psychological perspective this is our id this is spelled id now what charles darwin was essentially saying is that this is of course tied into our animalistic side this is what in the bible is sometimes termed as very sinful desires this is the desire for somebody from a sexual perspective this is the desire to do really evil things however essentially what stevenson was trying to do in jekyll and hyde was to show that we all have two sides to us so finally let's move on to the quotes and the key characters so i've selected 
four of the main characters. Really, these are the main characters that you need to be aware of and you need to understand. Of course, you need to understand all these other characters, but you don't need to remember quotations from them because you will not get questions related to them. The first key character, of course, and the main character is Dr. Jekyll. So we know that Dr. Jekyll is a really respected and well-known scientist in his social circle in London. However, we obviously know that he's hiding this terrible secret, which is he's also Mr. Hyde. Now, in terms of quotations related to Dr. Jekyll, the first is, he is a smooth-faced man. This is playing on the idea of physiognomy, this idea that if he looks like a tall, well-made, smooth-faced man, he must be a good man. The other key quotation to remember for Dr. Jekyll is expression of dot 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 abject terror. This is the quotation related to when Dr. Jekyll essentially started transforming before Mr. Utterson and Enfield's eyes into Mr. Hyde and then he shuts down the window before they see the complete transformation. Of course, this really creates a sense of mystery and a sense of horror within us as readers as we read of this. The final quotation, and this is tied to the letter that he leaves behind, is man is not truly one but truly two. And of course this ties into the theme of the dual nature of man, this idea that actually it's impossible to have one side, it's impossible to have a completely good side, and actually we all have a hidden and darker side. The other key character is of course Mr. Hyde. Now the key quotations to remember, firstly damn juggernaut, this is a really horrifying description of his appearance. The other key quotation is when he's described as trampled calmly on a little girl, this is on oxymoron, in other words contradiction you can't trample calmly. Again this shows kind of how contradictory his character is but also how evil and cruel his character is. The other quotation is when he's described as killing Sir Denver's Carew with ape-like fury and this ties in of course to Charles Darwin this idea that he almost killed him like an ape he was very animalistic in his savage killing and the final quotation is he bore Satan's signature this is to show just how evil Mr Hyde looked and this plays on the idea of physiognomy the other key character to remember quotations from is obviously Mr. Utterson, who's the lawyer of Dr. Jekyll. And the first is to describe his appearance. He was of rugged countenance. He was really serious, very austere as a person. And he was actually the quintessential Victorian gentleman. He was very quiet. He was happy to hold secrets. And of course, his profession also required him as a lawyer to hold lots of secrets. The other key quotation to remember from Mr. Utterson is reputable acquaintance. And this is a description of how he was the last reputable acquaintances of downgoing men. In other words, men who were of the upper class, men who were Victorian gentlemen, but for whatever reason, their reputation was in ruins. However, Mr. Utterson would help them try to survive this reputational downfall. The final quotation is, professional ambition and this describes how his eyes lighted up with professional ambition when he realised that the person who was killed by Mr Hyde was actually a really important MP. This is Sir Denver's Carew. Again this shows that actually Mr Utterson isn't that moral in the sense that he wasn't that concerned with the death of the man until he realised that maybe he can profit from finding Mr Hyde and handing him over to the police. Again, this shows actually that he's not entirely moral and he's more concerned with reputation than actually the morality of Mr Hyde's actions. Now the final key character to remember is Dr Lanyon and of course we've mentioned this, Dr Lanyon was a very good friend of Dr Jekyll, he's actually a really interesting contrast and we can also describe him maybe as a foil to Dr Jekyll's character. When we talk about foil by the way this means a character who shows the shortcomings in another character. Now Dr Lanyon who's also a man of science actually respects scientific limitations in what he can do and this is shown through the fact that he's completely against what Dr Jekyll does and how he experiments with science. Now in terms of quotations the first is the description of him initially as a hearty healthy gentleman. This shows that he is a really really vivacious very sociable and very gregarious character and of course this is a real contrast to how sick and how ill he looks towards the end before he dies. The other key quotation is of course unscientific border dash. This describes how much he was totally against what Dr Jekyll was doing and he was completely against his scientific experimentation. And the final key quotation to remember for Dr Lanyon is deep-seated terror of the mind. This is the description of how he looks like when Mr Utterson finally sees him before he dies. He is haunted by something and we as readers are really intrigued but also horrified. We wonder what Dr Jekyll did that made him so horrified and so scared to the point of death. So that's all. If you found this video useful, do make sure you look back over it in order to take notes but also as I mentioned this whole mind map is going to be available for download so make sure you also use it as part of your revision.